On a hot, humid day, I went to a water park. With my kids, of course, because it would be quite awkward to go by there by myself. <laughs> and almost everyone was having fun. All the kids were running around, enjoying the water. And I noticed, and I overheard this conversation between a mother and a child, because that's what I do at water parks, or in general, eavesdrop on people. <laughs> I saw this girl really puzzled, and she was looking up at her mom, and then mom was looking down at her, and she said, well, you cannot play with those water balloons. And the girl, puzzled, looked up and said, says who, mom? And do you know what? I was puzzled even more so. Why didn't she ask why? What did she say says who? Is that a problem we face as a society? Or even at work? That we make our decisions or drive our decisions based on the authority and not the reasons behind it? And that is the premise of this talk. I want to talk with you today, along with this my long exercise here, <laughs> is that process, as we heard even in the Seattle Sea Mariners discussion, that it's not all about the end product, it's about the process. And how we look at the data and how we work through that process, that's when we get to the end result. And that's the premise of the talk. I also want to show the dangers of misrepresenting data or showing the information how it could mess up with our minds. So on this slide, you can see there are two panels on the left-hand side, your left-hand side, and your right-hand side, two different charts. Participants were shown only one side or the other. Or you can call them hungry college students also. The participants were. On the left side, it's exactly the same data, even, even though the x-axis labels are different, it's the exact same data. But on the left-hand side, it was shown in a bar chart. And on the right-hand side, it was shown as a line chart. And as soon as you see the line chart, your mind starts thinking it's a trend. So the participants were then asked, what do you see? And they were asked to write down what their impressions were. And do you know what they said when they saw the left-hand side? As you would imagine, they said, average male is taller than an average female. Or average 12-year-olds are taller than average 10-year-olds. Very true. But do you know what they said when they saw on the right-hand side? It's amazing what they said. They said, it seems like there is a correlation between age and height. Although it's true, the data does not permit, because it's discrete data. And I should read this, because I know I'm going to get it wrong. Here are some participants said, the more male a person is, the taller he is. <laughs> So the person becomes more and more male and the height increases. <laughs> I find it very amusing. Obviously researchers did too. But that is the danger of representing the information, although the data doesn't permit telling you that story. In another example, exactly identical data was shown. In this case, they were studying risk avoidant behavior. So they were saying, that if I were to tell you that there is a standard toothpaste, if you brush regularly, you are, you'll be able to avoid the risk. At least 15 people will avoid the risk. So only 15 people will have that gum disease. As compared to the standard formula, your standard toothpaste, it will be 30 users out of 5,000. So you can see in the top frame, the numbers are still written on the bar graphs. So the data is shown numerically and graphically. But participants, again, hungry college, poor students, they saw either frame A or frame B. They did not see both. And then they were asked, can you tell us your willingness, how much you, you are willing to pay for the improved product? Now, can you tell me which frame the participants said that they are willing to pay more money? Absolutely. There was no competition whatsoever. As soon as people saw the data graphically, they said, yeah, we are going to be willing to pay that. Although the number is still written over there, so it's no different from the frame B. So they did the same study, but they changed the frames. So instead of showing the risk, they showed how many users gained from using the improved toothpaste. 
So let's see my math. 15 minus 5,000, so 4,985, something around like that. And so it was a long bar graph. And what, you know what they found? They did not find any significant difference. So when, when data is showing that you can avoid a risk graphically, you are more willing to pay more for that. So that's an amazing conclusion that such simple thing can make a such a drastic dif difference. And as data analysts and as data professionals, we have to watch out for such things and make sure that we are mis not misrepresenting data, but actually showing the relevant things to our readers. So here's a summary of the talk so that you can leave early, enjoy the beautiful Seattle, or maybe throw some birds at some pigs or something, or check out your flights. But here's a summary of talk, this whole talk. Eight, eight main points. Above all, do whatever you want to do, but show data about everything else. Some of these are on my words. I'm standing on shoulders of some, some, some giants in this industry. Maximize information to pixel ratio. Provide and focus on clarity. Plan for your graphic. The process is critically important. Choose the right format. Make the information very accessible and very easy to the reader. And decide your objective, whether you want to inform or do you want to pursue it. That will decide your graphic. And above everything else, tell a story. It's very important that you tell a story. So first point, Edward Tufte said, the information visualization expert, he said, show data variation, not design variation. Now look at this graphic. It's showing the spending by states, and it's ranked ordered by the most, the state that's spending the most amount of money, and it has all these state flags and everything. Can you imagine how much time I attended Kristen's session earlier. I appreciate all the work that they do in, when they're designing all these things. But can you imagine how much efforts they, the designers spend in putting all those flags? And it even has a caption line. It says, graph starts at 20,000. How cute. <laughs> so infographics are cute, but they don't tell us the whole story. Look at how much space they have, it has taken, but has given very little information. So we have to remember to maximize information to pixel ratio. I love this one. Very colorful, very pretty. No, I don't really, I don't. <laughs> it shows you African countries by GDP, and it has again the kind of a sort, but it has used I don't know how many colors, and the block size somehow represents the spending or the GDP money that they have. I don't understand economics, so I will just call it GDP money. Please forgive me. <laughs> but see how much space again it has taken and has given very little information. But here's another example when you, this is called a dot plot. In that much space, it's telling you very easily that South Africa leads the pack by a huge margin. And it has taken only this much space. You can easily compare various countries. You can say where exactly they stand. So this is a really, really good example of how you can maximize information to pixel ratio. And you can come up to such a conclusion only when you have clarity. So again, you have to remember that data visualizations are not art, but they're advertisements. Advertisements to do something, either to sell, inform, or persuade our reader to take some action. I love this graphic. This was Wall Street Journal. It shows you very clearly why Chick-fil-A, I don't know whether you followed the controversy Chick-fil-A had, the owner or founder, whoever it was, he said, I do not, do not support gay marriage. Then Wall Street Journal presented this simple graphic, very neutral. It does not tell you any direction that you should take as a reader. It just tells you the data in a very accessible format. It removes all the distractions. It doesn't have any grid lines. It doesn't have anything. But it has the very key components of everything. Size of the circle shows you how many restaurants each region has. And then the regions are color coded, which you can further explore by the opinions of the residents there, whether they support gay marriage or not. So we can clearly see Chick-fil-A's constituency is in the areas where they oppose gay marriage. Hence, they are able to make that comment. So very simple data. I love this graphic. 
It, it serves its, and meets its objectives and clearly shows the story. Which begins us to this phrase, kick off with why and begin with so what. Any analyst worth his money will ask first why and not how. And after seeing the results, we'll say so what and not interesting. I see so many times on the listers, people will keep asking, oh, I have this problem. Which technique should I use? Linear regression, logistic regression, R squared, this and that. They're not asking why. Why should I do this? What is my objective? So again, an analyst worth his money will first ask why, not how, because that comes later. And they do not chase interesting things. So get ready for my big rant. Interesting is only that interesting. It's nothing more than that. It does not add any value. It does not tell us which direction to take. It does not tell us about anything. Interest is only that. Interesting is like to me when my kids tell me, when I ask them something, who did this wrong? I don't know who did it. It's exactly that response. Instead of challenging our intellectual capacity, we answer with intellectual dishonesty. We do not take those efforts to go extra mile. It's like someone sends you an email. FYI, interesting. Read this article. Well, thank you. <laughs> you angry bird user. You could have spent at least two minutes describing that article to me, what you found interesting. It's an excuse. Again, instead of challenging our intellectual capacity, we answer with intellectual dishonesty. And I want to read this to you. Some synonyms for interesting. Absorbing, affecting, alluring, amusing, arresting, attractive, beautiful, refreshing, riveting, stimulating, stirring, striking, suspicious, unusual, winning. There is not a single <coughs> synonym for interesting that says that somehow this is going to cause an action. And again, as data professionals, it's our job to create some kind of action from our readers. If there is one thing that you can take out from this session, it is this. Your success is defined by your reader's success, and your reader's success is only achieved when they take, take an action. So that should be our purpose of any analysis, any visualizations, or presentations. You should empower your readers, your users, to take some action. Think about Microsoft Excel. How they show you these grids where you can fit your data into it, into all these charts. They are encouraging you to use their chart types and not looking at your data. And that's when we fail into these interesting traps. We're just trying to fit our data into some type of chart. So have you seen my presentation before? Anyone? No one? So do you know what to do with this? OK. Please do this. Give a big round of applause for him. <laughs> there are many things that are interesting. For example, a study on Facebook, or as I like to call it, the new blue screen of death. <laughs> People who tended to like pushing someone, or walking with your friends and randomly pushing them into something or someone, had very few friends. <laughs> very interesting, right? Or, Wondering and getting all the news that garbage the news media are feeding us about knowing everything about birth of a child. By the way, I showed this to my supervisor at Michigan, and he told me, well, the answer is easy. What chance does the Kate Middleton have of giving birth naturally? 50%. Why there's a news article? <laughs> or wondering things like, if ET finds Voyager 1, will it phone Earth? Really, CNN, is that what we lose our sleep over? <laughs> what is useful, though, is when and which action to take. This is the Blanchard bone, 38,000 old bone. Our ancestors marked the lunar movement onto those, those bones. So as to they could plan for their next hunt, they would know where the deer are moving. And this was business intelligence. Then, this was the state of the art business intelligence thing. That's what we need to do. We need to move from interesting and get to action. And this is, this is going to be a controversial thing that I'm going to say. But fire your consultant if he says interesting. 
That's true. Because if he's producing decks and decks of slides and says, oh, this is interesting, this is interesting, he is not telling you the truth, what action you should take. So fire your consultant if he says interesting. But how do we get to process? These are my children, of course. You know, one day I was uh, taking a walk to park with my five-year-old son, five -year -old son then. He was five-year-old then. And we were just walking around, and we wanted to go to the park. So we were just walking. But he, being a five-year-old, kept looking at everything down there, kept looking up on the trees, just wondering about everything. I'm getting quite frustrated about not getting to the park. I got frustrated and I said, let's hurry up. And then he stopped looked at me. I said, why that? I looked at him. And then only did I realize that walking with him was more important than getting to the park. So in analysis and presentations and visualization, it's the same thing. It's not the end product. It's actually the process that we create something meaningful. So let's not focus on our end results, but let's focus on the process. How do we, how do we get to encouraging and coming up with this process. So there is a very good model of critical thinking, also used in design variations and coming up with innovation. Hi, Miriam. Very simple model. It says, diverge. When you are coming up with ideas, diverge. Because we are our own worst enemies when it comes to coming up with ideas. We are immediately judging our ideas and saying, ah, oh, no, man, it, it won't work. It's a bad idea. But what we need to do is focus on coming up with ideas. Just come up with ideas, whether it's a group exercise or it's an individual exercise. Just come up with lots of ideas. And then take a break. And then come back to it, maybe after five, 10 minutes or half hour. And then start converging. And make a few selections, make a few choices. Select something that makes the most sense to you. Select what would yield the best results to you. I have to warn you though, do not try this at home especially with your significant others. <laughs> uh, one day, my wife told me very nicely, and I know this is being recorded, so, hi, wife. <laughs> <laughs> she said to me very nicely, she said, your parents did not wish me happy birthday today. And you know what I did? I started applying divergent thinking, and I started explaining it to her. Oh, maybe they're sick, maybe they went out of the town, maybe they don't have a phone. Big mistake, don't do that. <laughs> I did not have a good day that day. <laughs> so, so far what we have seen, clarity, insight, objectives, and process, focusing on all those things. This is the giving us a slide. I have nightmares when I see charts like these. How many stacks of bars you are seeing, is it even telling a story? Probably not. It's hard to decipher and it's hard to see what's going on. So can you give me a couple of examples how we can improve this chart based on what you have seen so far? And the person who answers the second, second, will get this book. OK, somebody has to be first. <laughs> Someone there? A pie chart. OK. We'll come to that. We'll be sorry you said that. Okay, so first one was pie charts. You said stacking, uh, creating. Underneath each other, okay. Multiple charts for what? Different categories, okay. How about you? You had a suggestion? Okay, what would you show? Okay, so pie chart, multiples, small multiples, and again, uh, reducing the number of, uh, what amount of information, yes? Color palette, okay. Oh, that's a good suggestion. You, Carl. Okay. 
So, all right, right? <coughs> Label the persons? Oh, no, remove the labels. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. You just said 3D? <laughs> we should have a conversation afterwards. <laughs> Again? Ask why. Why are you showing this information? So those were all good answers, really great answers. 3D pie charts, probably not. <laughs> And this is one of the reasons. Choose the right format. Can you tell me what's wrong with this graph? <laughs> oh! I know it would be very politically incorrect thing to say, but 70% are backing Sarah Palin, so something is wrong with the data. I'm sorry. <laughs> But there's something fundamentally wrong with this chart. Yes? It's more than 100%. That's right. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, the 70% is less than the That's what I'm saying. That's a fantastic point, because that's the 3D effect which is coming at play. So it's kind of coming at you like Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that 63% is actually more than 63%, or either way, depending on how you look at it. Yes? So it, it actually, to me, it sort of looks like a pill that's coming right out of me that I have to swallow. <laughs> or the, something that's going to give me a What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> but what I think is wrong, apart from Sarah Palin, <laughs> is that there are no Newt Gingrich. Where is this data coming from? I, I don't trust this data. But obviously, no. The, the total should always be 100%. It's a pie chart. The idea of a pie chart that you're sharing the slices and you're saying, oh, this is the proportion of every slice. But the problem with that, that it wasn't with the chart, it was this with the study, because they allowed multiple choices. They said, yeah, you can say Sarah Palin, or you can say Newt Gingrich, apparently no one likes him. Uh, but right format would have solved that problem. In that case, a bar chart would be the most practical solution to this problem. So use right format. That's very critical. But that also obviously depends on your objective, whether you want to inform or do you want to persuade. So this is Noah Iransky's, who is a UW graduate, by the way, and lives in Seattle, has written a couple of fantastic books on data visualization. I'm a big fan of his. But he has this model where he says, depending on your objective, you have these multiple ways to take action. Whether you want to be informative, it's very easy. You just jump from data to the reader, dump it to the reader. You can take some steps to make it nice, but it's very easy. But if you want to use, or if you want to persuade your readers, then you need to hire people like Christine and some other folks who can do data visualization and can bring that art into it. But that requires effort. That requires significant effort. But it's well worth the effort. We'll see some of the examples. Here is another example Noah Ilinsky has his on his website, which I have some handouts, by the way, so you don't have to worry about some of these things. He presents all the different use cases, when and which encoding to use, because it is very critical to use circles when they're appropriate, to use lines when they're appropriate. And he provides all these different cases, use cases, on when you should use one of those. And that brings us to a very important topic of colors. Donna Wong, <laughs> Wall Street Journal's graphic editor, uh, in her fantastic book, I recommend you that book wholeheartedly. She said in this uh, in book, admit colors as gracefully as you would invite your in-laws. And I would admit this, that I don't understand this phrase. My interpretation is that avoid in-laws at any cost. <laughs> and I know this has been recorded, so I might be in big trouble. But my interpretation is that maybe we don't need to use color that much. Maybe we just need to use color when it's appropriate. That we minimize the use of color. But perhaps it's because of my inabilities. For example, I cannot speak English very well. I have uh, trouble stretching my E's and I's. 
So when I want to say pain, it becomes pen. Or when I want to say uh, mate, it becomes met. Or met, mate. When I want to say uh, sheep, it becomes ship. And when I want to say worksheet, it becomes work. <laughs> and then obviously people around me are joyous and they say, yeah, where that work? So minimize colors, if, use only when you need to use them. Here's a great example of when to use colors. This is an economist chart, so I love economist charts. Sometimes they are overboard, but this is a great example. It's showing the unemployment rate for some period of time. The lighter color shows the total unemployment rate, and the darker color shows for the past six months. So going back, great, great example when to use color. It's just distinguishing between two patterns. It could be gray or white or black or whatever, but it's still, this is a good use of color. Another great example. This is again, I think, the economist chart. Here you can clearly see that in infant mortality, all the countries have made tremendous progress, especially in Mali from 1970 to 2010. Tremendous progress. Good use of color, though. Remember, colors are not for prettifying, they are for distinguishing data. You have to use colors only when you want to distinguish. So here's a test for you. When you make something interesting, looking really pretty graph, take a black and white printout and see if you can still tell the difference between your data points. That's the test. But I will not pretend that I know a whole lot about colors, but obviously there's a big science field behind colors. Our friends from Tableau have mastered that. They have lots of people who work for in those places. Areas. Somebody mentioned the color palettes. But I rely on tools like these. This is the Color Brewer tool. It's an online tool. Again, I'm standing in the shoulders of giants. They, depending on your data type, sequential, diverging, or qualitative, you can select the different color palettes. Although this tool was created for maps, because then in maps it's very difficult to tell apart different regions and different colors. But you can use these, this tool for any type of analysis. And it's fantastic, it works really fast, it will give you the HTML colors, hex colors, whatever, whatever colors you want. And I want to show you something real quick. And I will have to jump back to... So this is R Studio, or R, running on R. And I'm just loading the Titanic data here. As you know, in Titanic, Very few people survived, and out of them, mainly they were females, even in the first class. So what I'm going to do is just create a ggplot. ggplot is a fantastic library. It lets you do fantastic things. So here's a graph, a basic bar graph. So this, these are the by default ggplot colors. Hadley Wickham, who is the core author, he's a professor at Rice University. He has done a lot of research on colors and everything. I don't agree with this color scheme, but this is what you get default. But let's say you don't like this. So what you do is you apply Tufty's th themes. Or you apply, apply uh, Tufty themes with Tableau colors. Or you create an economist. Or you create a few, Stephen Few. Or you create Google Docs if you wanted to. Or Wall Street Journal. And if you just wanted to have fun, you can have Excel 95 back. <laughs> <laughs> So R is a powerful tool. We should definitely use this. But why do we do this? Why do we, why do we use colors so that people can, or readers can distinguish the data very easily? It's because we want to make it easy for the reader. We want to make it accessible. We want, we want to make that information accessible to our readers. Time Magazine published this article on why medical bills are killing us. Fantastic article. Did you read it? Yeah? If not, definitely find a copy. Because all the numbers in this are so accessible to the readers. Here's one example. On, the, on one axis, you see the average healthcare spending in the, in the per person and life expectancy on the other axis. Can you tell me which country is in big trouble? <laughs> How long did that take you to answer? Less than one second probably, right? And why is that? 
because they succeeded in making everything very accessible and very easy to the reader. They removed all the backgrounds, they removed all the grid lines, any colors, extra colors, added captions when appropriate, but more importantly, they highlighted the Cree trend. Good use of color. Another great example from the same article. Sometimes the best type of a chart isn't a chart at all, it's a table. You should use a table when you want to give the most amount of details and most accurate information. Here is how a table could have saved this graphic. So Washington Post published this blog article on the news of Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp. So they, the top portion, that was their first attempt. Every unit that you see, so every circle, so this 1, 3, 19, so the radii were proportional to the acquisition value. So the first one could be one unit, third, three units, and then 19 units. Then someone commented on Twitter, that's the you know, fantastic value of Twitter. Somebody commented that it should actually be by area, and not by radii. And I looked at it and I said, I confessed. I said, you know, what difference does it make? It should still be proportional. But then they reposted it, the, this version. And then I calculated the numbers. So when you actually do by radii, this number is 39% bigger. But when you do by area, it's only 5.33% bigger. So amazing things, very small graphics, very small details can misrepresent your information very quickly. And if you think encoding circles is hard, try that with tanks. <laughs> I don't know how they pulled this off. Once you have your chart, it's very important to provide context. I have this very good friend. He likes to tell really tall tales, likes to exaggerate things. So one day he told me, and I'm going to try, I mean, I know I already have Indian accents, but I'm going to try even more Indian accents. He, he told me that my son is this tall, five-year-old son, this is this tall. I looked at him, what are you talking about? How is that possible? So he looked at me and he said, well, you didn't let me finish. Here is where I measured him from. <laughs> so context is very important. You have to provide context. So in this case, you can see how oil prices have spiked up on various occasions. And you can see Iran-Iraq war and post 9-11. But you can clearly look at the data, and it's perfectly fine to use a time series line data. You can use a line chart or an area chart is just filling up the data. But it's very important that you provide context. And we want to make it easy to the reader, so we don't want to cause neck pain. And that's the least we could do. We are already expecting a lot from readers. We don't want to cause some neck pain. This is from one of the, I will protect the identity of this graph because I know some, some of my friends could be here from this company. But it's one of the top fundraising analytics company and they produce this chart. Can you tell me what's wrong or how you can improve this chart? You can really tell with the why. Is there a book in it? She, <laughs> who was that? You say, is there a book in the end? <laughs> <laughs> Put the axis. Put the axis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Horizontal bar graph, yeah. So horizontal bar graph, turning the labels. But I was also intrigued by this zero person. <laughs> they found it so important to show that zero person, but there are no users for Stata. I don't know, maybe they sold all their shares or something. But yeah, I think the best thing to do here would be just turn the labels, have everything saying Microsoft Excel, SPSS, other, and just have the percentages as the, and then you can sort them also. So it's just very easy to do that. And I see this, and I always have a Kramer moment when I see this. Like, OMG is all around. <laughs> this, is, this is from another consulting company. This is a campaign pyramid. It's showing you how many gifts you require and what progress you have made. Astonishing how, where humanity has come. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you, based on what we have seen so far, to tell me how we can improve this chart. It's again showing number of gifts required and progress we have made. Third person will get this book. <laughs> That's the last copy. It, it needs a, a summary goal. I can't, I can't figure out <laughs> progress toward a goal, but it's confusing. Okay. So more references, more captions that will improve. Yes. Okay. 
Just bar charts with percentages, yeah? Miriam? I would, I would remove all the lines and go down. You're already giving a number, and that just sort of looks like a scary 1970s building. <laughs> <laughs> so just remove the bars, uh, yeah, the, the dividers. The progress, line, the progress line should be one color. It, it shouldn't be red, it should be green or something. Yeah. Unless we're in China. And then, uh, <laughs> and then there needs to be, the percentage needs to go across. But also, now that I'm thinking aloud with you, the whole thing with the pyramid, I can't tell if 10,000 is really better than you know, 25,000. And we have a winner. <laughs> there is no need to show this as a pyramid. It could be just a straight line. Oh, with, with progress lines, just progress bars. And you just saw, as Marian said, that we don't need to have those divided lines. But any other suggestions? Maybe. Yes, Brian. Well, well, really, so if you're looking at the 100,000 line, you, you, need, you want 100 gifts of 100,000, which equates to 10 million. So what if those 100,000 range gifts are actually 150,000? So you want to look how much progress you're making towards 10 million in that category. Right. Because you could have raised much more than Point five million or whatever. Yeah. Joe? Uh, table. Perfect. Love it. Yes? A triangle skirt up is very obscure as far as there is no hierarchy. We just yeah. it's very abstract. All right, we'll move on. So we'll go back to our friends from Fox News. <laughs> Here they're showing a bar chart, seemingly harmless, right? Federal welfare received in the US by quarters for calendar years. Nothing, nothing problematic. <laughs> can you say, can you, can, can you tell me what's wrong? Yeah, the whole zero the Perfect. It's not starting from zero. Anybody else? And that could be because of this, what he said. So when you create a chart, this is what Excel is showing you. This is exactly what we have for Fox News. So I, I know I'm picking on Fox News, but this is, this is not their fault. This is Microsoft's fault. <laughs> so here is what we are doing. So we are just creating this. So exact same chart. But we are going to clean it up. We don't need, we don't need number of Americans. We know it's number of Americans. We are going to get rid of the grid lines. And then, see, let's see what happens. Let me blow this up a little bit. And so why even start at 92? Let's start at, uh, what is that, 96? Even bigger, right? <laughs> but let's see what happens when we change it to 0. Almost no difference, right? <laughs> doesn't, look like, doesn't look like there is any difference there. So it's very important when you're creating vertical bar charts, they should always start at zero. Another example, again going back to Fox News. And I, I, again, I'm not picking on Fox News. When you type in Google Images, wrong bar charts or wrong charts, this is what shows up. <laughs> So again, the same problem, it's not starting at zero person, but let me show you what happens in that example. So again, Microsoft is providing you this when you create a new chart, but let's get rid of, get rid of this. And you know, why even start at 32? Why are we doing Democrats the favor? Let's start at 34. So even bad, right? But let's see what happens. I'm going to show you one more thing. Let's change it to a line chart. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> and then one more thing. We squeeze the aspect ratio. <laughs> oh, my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> the US is in so much trouble. <laughs> but let's change it to zero. The regular day in the office. So it's very important that you use the, use the right format. And bar charts. Definitely, you should use y axis as the zero. So we'll keep moving on. This is another great, great example when to use a line chart. This is a good example where it's showing uh, from a state school 
how state support has gone down and tuition has gone up. So it's meeting its objectives to show the students that, yeah, we really need to jack up the tuition. We are sorry, but we need to. But obviously, I would remove all the 3D effects and that angle effect. There is no need to do that. We can just have two lines, and it would serve its purpose. So MIT researchers developed this unobtrusive, dirty-looking band. It measures nervous system activity. And they again found some participants to put this band on, but it measures your nervous system activity. So this one really, really poor guy wore this band for seven days, 24 hours. And this is what they found. So it's measuring the nervous system activity. So when, they're, when this person was studying for exam, or doing homework, or even sleeping, there was some nervous system activity. But when they were in classrooms, <laughs> I mean, we should save that topic for a whole conference. But that's a great example when to use a line chart. It's showing you the trend over time series. And it's even broken down into number of days, rather than cramping all the seven lines in one chart. Great example. Line charts are very hard to screw up, but some people manage to do it anyway. <laughs> even people who have good intentions, really good intentions. This was someone from the UK who just wanted to show the racial inequality between different colleges. Can you tell me quickly which, one, which line is King's College? <laughs> but a modified version would be this, just creating different facets, small multiples, whatever you want to call it. Some of us don't have the tools, right tools, to get the right answers. But if you just think about the process, you can circumvent these problems. So obviously, we need to come to the biggest conversation we have around Thanksgiving. When to use pie charts? Can you tell me? Never. <laughs> Almost never. There is not a good instance where we should use a pie chart. I wasn't afraid of flying in Boeing 787 Dreamliner plane, but after I saw this, this was from a VP of uh, strategic analytics or whatever, presenting at a conference, and I am scared of flying Boeing again. I don't know what he was trying to show. My, I, will, I will agree my math is slightly weak, but 2.4 plus 2 plus 2, it exceeds 6 trillion. And I don't even know what the slices are showing. <laughs> And I have given the link, so I'm not lying. You can check the presentation on YouTube. This is again from one of the fundraising analytics companies. I really don't know what they're doing. But please don't do this. Please don't do this. First of all, there is no use of using colors. There is no point in using the slices. I don't know why, as humans, we are so tied to the idea that everything should round up. Even in stack charts, we want to show the 100%. Why is it so important that we need to show the 100% total? Can we just not live with the fact that it, it, it doesn't need to add up? We can just show the facts as they are. But if you must, again, this is Donna Wong's recommendation. If you really, really must. She says that a pie chart is easy to read as a clock. So you should start the largest segment at 12 o'clock, clockwise, and the second largest segment counterclockwise. And then you just follow. But you should, not, you should never have more than five slices. If you cannot tell your slices apart, it's time for you to restart. Here is obviously one of the greatest examples we have always seen, the scatter plots relationships. So on x-axis, you can say number of beers I have had. And on y-axis, how many times I say I love you, bro, to my friends. <laughs> so obviously, this is a normal day. Everything is fine, just having a good time. This was a downer. We probably were drinking natural light or something. <laughs> this day, I don't know what happened. Maybe I saw really an old friend and I go. Oh. Last one, oh boy, the 18th beer did it. <laughs> Kidding aside, this is, this, is a, this is called the Anscombe's Quartet. Anscombe, the great statisticians from 1973, he developed this chart to show that how important it is to look at the data visually. Do you know what's funny about these data sets? It's not the same data, but same statistical properties. They have exact mean, exact standard deviation, even identical regression line. So if you were just to look at the data set, you would say, oh, these are all the same, something is good or something bad. But when plotted data visually, you see they are not the same. So he championed really using scatter plots as to visualize the relationship. In Haysburg, in the UK, these footprints were recently discovered in the sediments. But not for long, only for three days before the waves came back and washed all the sediments away. 
but not before, fortunately for us, the researchers were able to take pictures and use the technology that I cannot name. But they studied all this and recorded everything. And do you know what they found? They found 50 footprints of five individuals, including little children with full toes, which are 800,000 years old or close to 1 million years old. These are the oldest known hominin footprints out of, outside of Africa. Such a great discovery, such great work, and they do this in the research paper. <laughs> <laughs> now try mapping every foot size to the picture that you're seeing above, and try comparing that to the average girl's size and boy's size, and try comparing that to standard deviation. I love scientists, I love their work, but this didn't cut for me. Last point, it's very important that you are able to tell a story. It's very critical that you tell a story. New York Times did this graphic where it's the same data, September's job report, but it says how a Republican might see things on the latest trends and how a Democrat might look at things. So they will just show you the latest trend that, oh, my past six months it has really improved. So it's very important that you tell a story. Another example, the New York Times again did this this, uh, this graphic, but it's showing century of meat consumption. Can you tell me why and when beef and chicken consumption went up? First KFC opened, 1,000 McDonald's restaurant. Great story, very clean, very neutral, lots of context. Know your story and tell it. And I'm going to leave you with this. Voyager 1 spacecraft took this picture. About 4 billion miles away from us. 4 billion miles away from us. There are more than 600,000 individual pixels in this picture. And Earth is taking less than one pixel. If your story is as powerful as this, do not worry about what I said just now. Use as many colors as you want. Use as many pixels as you want. But only if your story is this as, as powerful as this. Here's what Carl Sagan said. From, distance, from this distance vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's home. That's us. That's here. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their life. The aggregates of our joy and suffering and economic doctrines, thousands of ideologies, religions, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived here on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph, they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dog. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in this universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with, with another, to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. Thank you. No? Oh, boy. That's not a good sign. Yes. No, it's not like, it's not art. It's Arabic.
It is. When you're telling your story, you know your audience. It's depending on your objective. If you want to pursue it, you will tell the story as you like it. But is that what we want to do as data professionals? Do we want to tell and do we want to stick to the truth or do we want to? So the question was, is there a leeway, is there a room to modify the, the data or the charts so that we can tell our story? Obviously, that's exactly the point. But as data professionals, we have to watch out for such dangers that we are misrepresenting or mishandling the truth. Yeah. No, in, in bar, bar graphs, there is no other way that you cannot start apart from zero. You have to start at zero. And in any other case, yeah, you can twist and turn the data, but in bar charts, you cannot start unless you have zero. But you can create a line chart without a zero. So you can start a line chart wherever you want. But you have to watch for the aspect ratio, otherwise the things like I showed, that could happen. Yeah. So the question was, are there any tools that allow us to create uh, graphics very easily right? As a, as a software developer? So I think, again, going back to what I said just earlier, it really depends on your audience and depends on your objective. It's not about the tool. I mean, we heard from Howard yesterday that it's about people. In this case, it's about our readers. It's not about our data chops or it's, it's not about our sophistication that we can bring in creating those flag types charts. It's about what we want from our readers. But in terms of exact tools, there are many, many available. If you want interactive charts, all New York Times charts, a um, lot of them use JavaScripting, d3.js. And I have some handouts left over there along with my business cards that lists out some resources. So you can uh, feel free to look into those also. But there are a lot of interactive JavaScript libraries that you can use. And d3 is the most popular one. Yes, Joe? Um, can we go back to the bar chart starting zero? That's a fantastic point. Yeah, if the differences are really, really too small, it's best to show the differences between two data points rather than just showing the bar graphs or stacking the bar graphs or showing two bar graphs. On I know what you're talking about. It's best to show the differences. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have some of them listed in this handout. I have only 30 copies. I did not expect to be room for this book. <laughs> but if you email me, my business cards are also, which I brought more. Those are free, so. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Christine. That's a great point. I mean, I think going back to your presentation, it has to be about the process. It's about wireframing, coming up with multiple solutions. Again, as a, our job as analysts, it's not about that one perfect end solution. It is, uh, her question was, at what time do we start worrying or thinking about look and feel of the infographics or just the graphic? I think it should be from the point zero. That's when we should start thinking. Our, again, our job is to evaluate multiple hypotheses. There is no single hypothesis and eliminating the hypotheses that do not meet our objective of telling a fantastic, great story. So I would include everyone in the whole design team. So New York Times, again, Amanda Cox, she's the fantastic designer for all the visualizations that you see on New York Times website. That's a big, big team that she has. So she works with different uh, design artists and also data folks, but she brings everything together from get-go. So as soon as the news is broken, as soon as the Writers tell them what charts they need, they start working together. 
Yes? Is there anything really out of the box that you found interesting and useful? Unlike, you know, that pyramid. Out of the box, certainly, but not interesting, not useful. I'm thinking about something along the lines of uh, Randall Monroe, who writes at KCD. He was presenting data first and death. And he would have the word first link every, you know, a tenth of a second or however many, and death. So you see them side by side. You see, you know, first half much more than that. Yeah. You get the sense of, of, of time. Is there anything really outside of the box that you found interesting and useful? <laughs> Can we toss that paper back there? <laughs> I would say Tableau is a great tool. Tableau Public, you can play with the data, explore the data. But I find R the most useful and the best tool ever. I tweeted this morning after watching Alyssa's uh, session also. I use Tableau for exploration. You try to find patterns, because Tableau lets you do that very quickly, very fast. But in R, you can get exactly what you want. And you can reproduce and regenerate that every time. So R takes a lot of work. But as you saw in some of those examples, you can customize each and everything. You can even write automated reports for your whole university divisions. You can break it down by different levels. So R is very powerful. I will, I will definitely look into it. All right, guys. Thank you very much. You have been a fantastic job. <laughs>